<laughs> I'd be two meters in like you can't tell me you've not been in this position before. It's like, no, I've never threatened yeah. blackmail someone with being a <laughs> for not retweeting my posts. Actually, it does look like a Microsoft Teams background. Yeah, it's not. It's in a little restaurant in Bali where Virgil loves to come. It's like his main little free diving play. And apparently, it's actually like one of the main free diving spots in the whole world. So people travel it and like it's mental. Like you literally, you go out a little bit and then it's just like boom, 25 meter drop off the coral pretty much straight away. Um, yeah, it's pretty fucking. You just look down and it's just nothing. It's just blue. So you dive 12 meters. Yeah, 12 meters? so I built up. Yeah, so apparently level one is 12. Um, and it's meant to take you like a few weeks. And like apparently three meters is like max you should go first time. But I could, for some reason, I think probably because I've been water a bit as a kid, I can clear, I can equalize upside down, which Virg said it took him like six months to equalize upside down when you're going down. Um, but I managed to do it. Yeah, luckily, like first few tries. So yeah, I went yeah, six, seven meters yesterday. And then today just went, 12, 12, 15 meters. That's nice. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's crazy. He's just talking about, it's like, it's all, he's like, when you go to like the free diving club, he was like, you notice a change in the type of person. He was like, that's where all the high performers are. He's like, the reason I live here is because this is where like all the proper wealthy people live. Where I was like, we bumped into one guy and then afterwards he was like, oh yeah, you know that guy? He's like a multimillionaire in Bitcoin. He was like, yeah, that's why I live here. Um, whereas like in Changu, the main hotspot, he said it's like mostly just influencers, but he was like, yeah, cause all, everything about free diving is like, how much can you just like calm your mind? So when you go down, you don't panic, you can deal with stress. Like you start like convulsing cause your body needs oxygen. So you feel like convulsions and you have to be like, oh, nah, this is just cool. It doesn't matter. Like you can, you've got like another like five minutes to breathe. Um, so a lot of it is just like, how much can you deal with that? And just be like chill and get to the top. Um, so it was like, yeah, it's like he's like, I'm teaching you how to become a high performer. <laughs> Glenn, is that about you? Do you like swimming? I'd be two meters in, like, or you know, I can't do there's it. Also, there's also there's a there's a fish there's a fish called the trigger fish, and it's like this big fucking yellow fucker, like about two feet long, and if you go too close to it it'll just make a fucking beeline for you and like bite a chunk of your skin out. And so he's like, sometimes like people get someone's lips or like cheek and it's like not a big bite, but it's just like a little bit of chunk. So he was like, don't go fucking near it. And it's just like, it's this fish that is just by itself, just like fucking standing around like this, ready to go fucking <laughs> mental at someone. Way of bite, like a perfect chunk of skin off. Yeah, yeah. It'll just take a little chunk out, like sh straight bite off. Oh, do you see one? Yeah, saw two. You can always see them. They hang out in this certain spot and you just sort of just not many go too close. Oh, I'd go with the air, air harpoon. Just harpoon. <laughs> yeah, just get a douche. Put it on what, the grill. Um, yeah, what have you been? Wow, well, Glenn, you've been at a little wedding, haven't you? Yeah, it was a... Yeah, I've been you, at the wedding. What was it? You took a fight on with her and uh, started a fight with an MMA fighter. Yeah, I challenged Kai. Um, anyone knows him as a Finnish MMA fighter in a sport. He's, I challenged him to a fight. I told him I've had a few rounds on a heavy bag. That doesn't work. I'm ready for you. I can take him. Five pipes. It's 17 in. hours a day screen time, so maybe he's past it. 17. Yeah, he's on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, probably others as well. He's a machine. He's got a lot on YouTube, isn't he? He's got like 3, yeah, he's 000. like, yeah, he does. He's, he's smashing it. Try if Ennis, he's, he's probably one of my like... favorite guys on X, just be Finnish. He's an, he's an MMA fighter. He's never claimed for any kind of intellectual, but he just developed his own writing style. And I remember when he came up, he had like 200 followers. He was getting like 300 likes a post just because everyone's I've never seen this weird, like cryptic writing style where it's like a red fish, many chances, never again. <laughs> yeah, it's probably cryptic. My first interaction with him, I actually just followed him for the first time weeks ago. So I was in a space and Michael Garisto came in, pissed out of his mind. And one of the first things Kai said to him was like, Michael, I will ravage you. Which is like what? <laughs> um, yeah, fucking interesting. But the first time he DM me, it was just Glenn. I will dethrone you in caps. That was it. Beyond that. 
that's undying confidence when you know you can like kill someone in a matter of seconds on the street. Yeah, I have massive respect for anyone who's like an actual <laughs> fighter as well, MMA, boxing. I don't know, it's just like a cool skill to have. It's one of those things I always wish I did, but never actually did. Yeah, same. <laughs> you laughing at the dog in the background. <laughs> Is that a dog? <laughs> Someone laughing. Black dog. A black get, dog in the get, distance going down. The harpoon gonna. Powerful. I just like fighters as well, especially it's on the, the internet when most people are like, so literally like a wet piece of bread in real life. Yeah. Also, the grit it takes to get in any sort of ring. Like, I just have huge respect for that because that's fucking te- like knowing you might just get absolutely knocked out in front of like. Your family, friends, your family, everyone, friends. and getting in there anyway, like that takes fucking balls of steel. Yeah, exactly. It's huge. Um, as a, have you had any um plagiarism on tweets lately? Either of you? Any more plagiarism? Well, just in general, in general. Yeah, the last I don't, week. Honestly, I'm trying to be like off the timeline. Like, I don't spend too much time on it, and it's actually been quite nice not just looking at it constantly. You know, you sometimes open it. It's like platitude, platitude, milestone. Like, gets a bit boring. So I tried not to look at it too much. Um, um, apart from Dill calling out that obvious copy paste of one of my tweets a few months ago. I haven't seen any, but I haven't been looking for it. I'm sure it still happens. He only that copied your brutal. hook. Yeah. <laughs> copy the hook like the same day and then claim he didn't copy it. Right, it's just a bit weird. Yeah, for nice yeah, that. It's gone like he's stoned or something. Yeah, that was a pretty, hot spot. pretty blatant copy. It's always, yeah. it's funny, like Twitter, everyone sort of skirts around the big thing. So whenever someone just like outright calls someone out, it's always like, oh, fuck, did he actually did it? Um, yeah. Well, he copied the typo. And chose fire. Yeah, which is fucking different level. On My the thing is day. like, yeah, I, I I think like second chances. I think if you copy a tweet, just own it. Say whatever. Didn't mean to do it. It's fine. I don't. I don't honestly even care. I still, I, mean, I still follow him. So, but if you do it like two or three times, and it's obvious. Like you're probably a bit of a loser. And I might, I might block you. It's my stuff you're copying. Yeah, and I I do get with the other one. You just copied the idea. Like the actual tweet was different. He sort of made it into a long form. He fleshed it out. I say you I wouldn't have said that really was an idea. Yeah, but when you've copied in the past and then you're stealing my big idea constantly, it's like, well, you wait a day or yeah, your own fucking top line. Yeah, that's the thing, really. There's nothing like outright wrong with it. It's just because you know he's done it in the past that you're sort of just like you're slightly more on edge or slightly more sensitive to the fact that like ah, oh, he's just seen that and done it again. But I mean, yeah, like everyone, I feel like you won't do it. Like you won't do it again. Everyone makes a little mistakes, don't they? I actually, I think Dakota's convinced that i copied him because on the same morning that he did a like traveling solo tweet i did the same one in platitude form and i was like traveling solo will teach you more about self-confidence than any self-help book <laughs> he like commented under it two screenshots almost the same platitude it's <laughs> like traveling solo will teach you more about yourself than like any self-help book and i've obviously just like read the self-help book just fucking associated it and i was like oh mate i'm so sorry he was just like so question and i was like mate i swear i'm not stalking you i generally just a chance chance yeah but that happens that happens sometimes it's quite funny everyone talks about the same stuff constantly like the whole traveling solo will teach you it's not like that's not like a rare opinion as you would call it is it really it's like quite common held latitude so it can just happen i've had it happen a few times where people oh are you copying this guy is he copying you like mm. we just talk about the same 10 things constantly yeah it happened with the ps as well i did a tweet about the power of the ps and the next on this on like the same day or the next day charles miller did a whole email about the power of the ps i remember dill being like what the fuck and you just never know like it could just be chance maybe someone sees it there's a i mean there's a lot of people on x aren't there as you say chatting about a similar pool of opinions the chances of two people picking the same similar pool of things is not wildly yeah. Wildly off chance. Yeah, exactly. It can easily happen. It does happen quite often. Yeah. What we think about the Pro Awards launch at the moment, I know we've touched on this a little bit, but I know there's been a lot of this ongoing and um, there's been some like up and down changes to the marketing and strat and all that sort of thing. And I know you, Dill, worked with two of them. I actually worked with one. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts on the whole thing. Um, yeah, I think they're... I don't know, like they've 
they changed the the thing I don't like is when people change the prices for a cohort, like the first day's like early bird access and then it goes up. I don't really see the like I get it with like festivals and stuff, but for a cohort I don't really understand it. Um because if I didn't buy it on the first day, I'll probably not buy it on the following days. Um and then what happened with the price? It was like they six hours in they didn't get a sale and then they lowered the price. Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't know. That seems a bit weird. I don't know. I wouldn't have done that. You just gotta back yourself with the price. Yeah, the price is the price. You can't just change it constantly. Um if I'd seen them not make a sale and then decrease the price by seventy five percent. I would have just thought, well, well, they're going to decrease it again. So, and also, if you've just written thirty pages of sales copy on a landing page, convincing me how amazing this is, it's going to solve my problems. And then you've said what it's worth to the page, and then you've just written a tweet saying, "Oh, it's worth three times less." Than it. It's our first time. Then you're kind of undermining it's the your same as, sales page. It's the same as like deadlines, right? So, like, if you say a deadline and then you extend the deadline, it's like, oh, fake scarcity. Yeah, we've seen this a few times lately, haven't we? And it's funny because at the time, I think you don't really, you know, oh, it's a bit of extra money. It's fine. I think 10, 20, 30 K, it's, it's a lot of money. But ultimately, the next time you tell me the doors are going to shut, I probably don't believe you. It just makes yeah. me, if you know, if, you, you, if you're doing these tactics, you just stick. I know we shut ours early due to high demand. But we actually did shut it early because it sold too many and we didn't want to like degrade the experience and let in tons more people. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I think what you mentioned as well is like each of those three could have done one to ones, group coaching, or something like that first before jumping straight to cohort. But I think because they've seen us do a cohort sort of, and it's what seemed to be out the blue and do really well, everyone just thinks, oh, that's the easiest way to make money. When in truth, it's like it's not necessarily easy. Like if you're just going to do simple group coaching, that's probably going to help you for better initially, especially if you can't fight on the price point. And it only re- like one of the big things for us is we wanted our selling point was we're a small creator doing a cohort, which no other small creator was doing. So we sort of created a little new market. That we tapped into where all these people wanted to join a cohort. And then there was um, the lower end taken. And then there's our end sort of battled again with Seb's one. And so like what you've got left is like the few little, little, little like crumbs left that you can bite into, which they then tried to copy the same thing, the same thing, like three people with beginners, we're here to help you. Basically the same idea, but way cheaper. And obviously the problem with if you're doing it way cheaper and you're giving away loads of your time, it's now you're like locked up for three months. When if you'd have just carried on doing one to one coaching, or maybe like one thing Virgil mentioned that's interesting is like you could just test out a workshop. Like realistically, like you if you're instead of committing yourself to three months, like do what we're doing now in a way, but forget the cohort. Just do a workshop together, see how you work as a three, see how many people you can bring in. And then from there, you could sort of decide if you were maybe even from that, you could upsell them into like a little group coaching thing instead of making like this massive launch on public, which everyone is talking about, trying to have a little go at the big ones, but then not really having the, not really having like the knowledge to back it. And then also like one thing, like not being that, because we've obviously done like pretty similar thing. I, if they ask me questions about it, like what do you think is the best route? I'd be more than happy to answer to any of those questions. But it feels like they've sort of just been like, oh, we'll just copy like Brooklyn, like get out there, see if we can do the same thing. Um, so yeah, I'd have probably been more curious and asked a few more people ahead before going ahead straight away with it because you do risk kind of damaging part, your brand a little bit. They built it first. Criminal sin. <laughs> it just feels it's like true. shiny object syndrome, right? It's just like everyone else would do it. We might as well try. But then if you do that, you need to be unique and kind of have your own like spin on it. There's a more to a cohort launch than just slapping up a a landing page because it's funny because you you can tell when someone difference between they've probably written that page and thought this page is freaking awesome it's amazing but like the difference between like a copied big idea and like the original big idea it's like night and day because you can see where they've tried to be like oh this is our stories here but actually when you're reading it as a customer it's like nowhere near as much sense mm-hmm. they should have done the alpha move would have been to just charge it like make it more expensive than growth farming yeah i respect the hustle i do respect the hustle like it's just a bunch of fucking um yeah. like being in a similar position like guys just trying to make it make some make some cash here and that but um yeah you've got to be just... careful especially when you've got a personal brand and there's so many opinions so many people talking and so many people watching that if you put a flag sent me wrong publicly then everyone's just going to be talking about it 
Um, yeah. All I, yeah, all I was doing at that age was fucking playing rugby, playing Call of Duty, and going to parties. So, like, that's fine. I don't know. That's fair. Always ask people who've done it for some kind of advice. Because that's what Save does on both occasions. We were going to do some stupid stuff. Yeah. We're going to cap it at 20. We're going to cap it at 20. Yeah. Now. I don't know how we came up with the pricing, but I think we originally, we wanted to do it at like five, 600. And... Yeah, five, 600. I think you boys are the ones who pushed it up. Or maybe especially even yeah. you, Dill. We're like, this is actually ridiculous doing this cheap. Let's push it up. And then, yeah, like regularly speaking to Sam Ocean, spoke to Virgil. Obviously, we had Tom Benny, who we were speaking to. Um, yeah, so definitely got a bounce ideas around. Um, you also, um, I respect also Logue's um, deleting his ratio tweet as well. Respect and delete. I don't think it's a question of respect. It's just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, okay. Maybe not. But as in, I think, he, I think he's taking the best move in a way instead yeah. of just holding, like being like yeah. trying to hold, hold on to it. Um, just deleting it, getting rid of it. I mean, I guess respect compared to coming out and saying this was my master plan to sell Crater Lab. Um, yeah, exactly. I deliberately <laughs> went viral. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right, buddy. The date and point is low. Yeah. Something I'd about- like to talk about quickly. Um, I saw yesterday a take on the time people were talking about, oh, you know, the worst thing that can happen is you have no, people have no feeling towards you whatsoever. It's better even if loads of people hate you. Actually, I don't think that's true. I think if tons of people hate your brand, I think it's good. No. Yeah, it's, it's fine to have a few haters. Like, that's fine. That's expected, Supposed especially to. as you grow. But having, like, hundreds and hundreds of haters. Um, trying to think of, like, a specific example. But It's like Kanye West after his recent Yeah, he's still relevant. He's still there. But financially, he's ruined. His brand is ruined. And I can't see how it's good in any way, shape, or form. Just... Yeah, neither. Anytime you stick your head up, you're just going to have loads of people throwing negativity on your posts or anything you do and having any sort of negativity if anyone's new and doesn't already know about you they're going to come on your post they're going to see oh fuck literally having in this comment section hates this person i'm not going to whereas if you just don't know then you're just like a regular person that normally like you're just someone who before they built their personal brand almost so then yeah it's much better yeah exactly you're gonna get dog piled constantly i'm like no one buys stuff of people they hate i certainly so right no ancient new development that I saw as well, which got a lot of hype when I retweeted it, was Elon gaming and live streams. Like whenever there's an update, yeah. I always like quote retweet it with the two eyes and see like what gets the most hype. And people seem to be super excited about that. And I've actually been testing out the live streams with Virgil here and Saul Dakota also doing them with Nicholas Verge. And uh, yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's good. Definitely. Do you say they get boosted more than spaces or more than? videos was it yeah definitely because the space is like no matter how big the video will always be first at the top of the bar oh, on the top nice yeah on your phone video is always first and yeah we did that one last night in the dark literally and there was only ever like five five to fifteen listeners at a time live but then checked it this morning and it was like a thousand people have viewed it um oh, wow. even though it's just like Wait, yeah it was just like 40, an hour i think Wait, so how do you do it on your phone? Do you, is it like, is it in the spaces part? Go on the camera. On your remote, would you have to be next to each other? Uh, yeah, so initially I wasn't sure. So I think you can do it, you can do either. So if you're doing it just when you're with each other, you can just go to camera and go live and get it up. And then if you're separate, I think you use OBS and just stream. So like, say if yeah. you had like us four on the screen, like we are now, you can stream yeah. this. And then people would just see a live stream of us. And it actually works really well because people just like comment. It's a lot more interactive than a space because you actively see like comments pop up straight away. So I know it's like you're almost interactive with people coming in a lot more than you are in a space. So I mean, we should definitely think about maybe setting one up. Um, if you're coming up to launch, especially because no one else is really doing them. And yeah, they seem to get boosted. It seems like the new thing, which no one else is really testing out and also starting to get known as like no one else has really watched one. So people are coming in like, oh my god, it's like the first live stream I've ever tuned into. Love this. So I think this definitely could be some. Basically, like, just... huge. Most people are too scared to speak, even aren't they? And videos are different. Most people are absolutely terrified of uploading their face. So, especially going live as well. I think you've got to have some of like weird confidence so, and put yourself ahead of PFPs and tech merchants. Yeah, there's a lot of like anon accounts out there, isn't there? 
like they do spaces and stuff, but as soon as it comes to like live streaming video, they won't be able to do it. Um, so it definitely gives like an edge to people who are willing to show their face. I think so. Especially if you have stuff to sell. Mm. Mm. Well, any kind of, if you're selling anything where you have any interaction with the person selling it, like it's great to actually know who the hell you're buying, buying from. I think it's one of the things JK Molina does really good, I think, because he's, he's got YouTube as well and he constantly links to it in his emails. You just see him constantly. Him actually talking to you and you get a feel for who he is, how he rolls. Mm. Um, saw an interesting, well, Bill sent over an interesting article from Rolling Stone about Twitter is at death store one year after Elon Musk take over. But so obviously this is the mainstream media, which we all know Elon is battling with. And then when you look at the stats, hundred billion plus impressions every day, 500 million posts, 1.5 million signups every day, That's which is crazy. up 4% yeah. from last year. Mental. People are spending 14% more time on X with 20% increase consuming video. And then Gen Z is the largest and fastest growing segment, almost 200 million every month. So getting the new younger people in, paid almost $20 million to creators, hashtag one news map in multiple countries. And this one that I was actually most surprised by is fifth most visited website in the world. Actually. That's nuts. Fifth most visited website in the world. Wow. Yeah, I feel like when the news kicks off, X does a little bit better, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is really good it for is. news. I always remember when stuff would happen, I'd go on to where you'd get the, like the really up-to-date stuff, like, you know, people taking videos of it with their own cameras, and stuff you can't read really on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to the Visa office the other day, and I sat down, and there was a dad, and the first thing he did, he had, like, two kids, first thing he did when he sat down is get his phone out and go on X, and I was like, that's so funny. I <laughs> think he was just consuming, and I was like, yeah. yeah, weird, but fifth most visited, that's, that's actually pretty fucking mind blown to be honest yeah i saw an interesting take as well where you know like we've got all this war stuff going on and someone said something like innovation and economics can be miles apart twitter directly influences geopolitics between nuclear states and it's worth half as much as progressive auto insurance so it's like you've got this little soft or like this website that just literally with a click of a button elon can tweet about like a war or something and affect it and it's just weird, isn't it? It's true. Yeah, look at what he did to the stock market with Tesla. Back yeah. He did a few naughty tweets and got in a lot of trouble. And, and Bitcoin. That's some doge. Anything yeah, like that. Yeah, he set the price instantly. Like, you know, he's actually having an impact on the economy with a single push of a button. I feel like because it's such a conversational platform, the more shit that kicks off in the world, the more traffic it almost drives to Twitter. Because, like, for instance, like this wall that's going on, like one of the first things I did was just like type it into Twitter. And you see, like, the president had live streamed, president of Israel um, had live streamed. And, like, everyone's just fucking chatting, doing tweets about it. Things are popping off. Like, it feels like, like, well, you can't really do that as much on Instagram because it's just like a picture and then everyone battling in the comments. And the same with YouTube. Um, yeah, exactly. One thing I've been chatting to Chris Dyson about, who's a million dollar marketer, online business guy. I can just drop value in the bootcamp a lot is uh, direction to go for my email list because everything it's called the Sunday snap. So everyone's come in for the weekly Sunday snack email sort of thing. But I'm feeling more and more like I've been sending more emails and I'm like at this point, it just does feel like it'd make more sense just to go full on for the daily email or something like that. So just thinking about like best ways to transition it, whether to just full front it, call it a daily snack, don't say anything. Or one of the things he was saying is like run multi one have kind of have two lists. So if people don't want the daily, they can opt out and just go to like the one a week, the Sunday newsletter one. But then Virgil was like, I would just like full front it, call it the daily sack and just go hard on the dailies like that. Um so yeah, who's the hero, what your thoughts are as someone who's been consuming everything and everything yeah. anything and everything Ben Settle. Yeah. I feel like most people in the newsletters, they flex like, Oh, I've got five K subs and stuff, but like who gives a shit if they're all there for this big freebie that arrives on the weekend, like big silver platter with loads of different dishes on it, no links because you know they can't get sold to. I just don't see the point. I don't, mm. I don't just know what it does, especially like hard teaching emails. Oh, here's how to do this thing. I think you're just conditioning people to be on your list for the wrong reason. Mm. My list at the minute, like it's funny, it's actually been steady for three weeks, even though I've been getting tons of new people coming through Hivo and getting new people on. I get so many unsubs. Still, like I get about as many unsubs as I get subs. 
but it's kind of like my list is becoming denser and denser. So like every day, mm-hmm. 10 people leave and like 10 new people come. So over time, the people that actually want to hear from you every day, like sticking around and people are buying stuff. Something I noticed when I had my newsletter, people would like click a little. And then when I started doing daily email, people would still click, but it took quite a while to build up the confidence where they would click quite a lot. My click through rate's gone up considerably just because people are like, oh, he, he, he always puts links there. He doesn't fuck me over when I, when I click a link. So they trust you to click the stuff more. Mads, you've actually noticed your click-through rate going up. Yeah, it's sitting up. It's anywhere between like 1% and 5%. It depends on the email, how well written it is, what I'm selling. Man, that's really interesting. What are your thoughts still? Because I know you've got, yours was the creator crunch, which is sort of like yeah. every Friday. I'm, yeah, I'm doing like a hybrid model now. So like three emails and then the newsletter on a Friday. It's just because like in my old job for this fashion company, they would do they would just sell throughout the week and then on the Saturday they'd do a massive eight links to different stuff they found interest in. And their brand has come around like they're the creativity brand now because they always think outside the box. They're like purpose driven brand and they just want to give back every Saturday. Like 80, 70, 80 percent of their sales come from email, like forty thousand subscriber newsletter. Um so I think like a hybrid model works, but again, if it's just one free thing on a on a weekend, you're probably bringing in the wrong type of customer. Yeah. Not to say you should hard pitch in every email either, because if you're just gonna unsubscribe, aren't you? You're like, oh boring, it just like sells. Does like full sales pitches in every email. They're just as annoying. It's trying to combine them into like infotainment it? where it's like entertaining yeah. mm-hmm. and then you get sold something at the end, it's like, oh I was born, so I don't mind. That's yeah. what I'm trying to combine. Mm-hmm. On this newsletter as well, even if it was like eight articles, there was like eight pictures that they could click on to see that article. But then always at the top of the bottom, there was a sell. So the product at the top, eight things, and then product at the bottom. Even when they were given free stuff, they were still like plug stuff to sell. Have you got an opinion on buttons? I was like, Virgil just briefly mentioned that. He was like, I don't fuck it. I never use buttons. I just like link it. It's more subtle. And over time, it actually builds up the click through rate. Because I go yeah. for like a big fucking orange thing at the moment. And I'm like, I was like, oh, fuck. I don't think in our space, the button is too bad. I don't think you get punished for it as much because they know you, they trust you anyway, so they'll click your button. But I think, mate, I'm not clicking a fucking random button, random email usually. Like, I used to embed the link into a text, but now I just put the link. Again, partly because it attracts a lot more attention. It's like, well, I can just see there's the big ugly link. If I want to click it, it's there. You know, I'm trying to like hide it or anything. And yeah, people can see it's like an actual link or it's like a Thrivecart link or a Gumroad link. It's not like embedded in the text and you click it and just screen start loading and your computer gets bought. I don't really mind it. I don't, either one works. Sometimes I'll just do like hyperlink. Sometimes I'll do an actual big red button. Don't really, don't think I guess about it depends. I guess it depends whether you're harder selling or softer selling. Because if it's like an oh, announcement yeah. to buy, yeah. then it's like maybe you want a button. Whereas if you're going for more of the daily emails where you you, you want to keep people happy so you're doing a bit softer you've still given value and instead of like oh here's a nice story and then like people can just see at the end of the story it's like this massive fuck off the big red buy button and it's like oh this is always just leading to a sale even if they know it sort of is already it's like they can't see it as can't see it as easily yeah, I, I just love writing emails i think it's really fun and you can repurpose mm-hmm. them as long form tweets i did that yesterday i just copy pasted one of my emails from a week and a half ago in it did it performed quite well as a tweet. Minimal editing, like the subject line was a hook, basically, which like, subject lines and hooks are not actually that different. Which is mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's what I want to do because at the moment I'm writing a long form every single day as yeah. a Twitter post. And I don't like going straight from long form and then just stick it into my newsletter because I'm like, it feels like my most loyal followers are already in the newsletter. And so they're the ones that have seen it on X. So I want to have the daily email so that I can write that one every day. And then like a few days ahead, constantly repurpose from the newsletter then to the long form mm. and just have it driving around like that. Because at the moment I'm like writing almost two long forms a day because I'll be writing it for the newsletter, yeah. writing one for the Twitter. And it's just like, there's got to be a way to streamline this better. The, the newsletter ones have got to take priority because there's been times where I've been keeping up to date with people's emails, but I have no idea what they're doing on Twitter. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's like the original content it has to go to the email list in my opinion. And then if you want, you copy paste it over to X, or do what you want. Yeah. Speaking, Eddie, Eddie did that recently. Yeah, I was going to say he did. Um, long... He did that Tony Soprano post. Um, Harry said he messaged him to say, "Oh, you mate, you need to put this as a long form." And he put it as a long form. Absolutely blew the fuck off. 
just copy straight copy pasted a couple of small edits. There's two birds, one stone. Mm-hmm. What are you saying, yeah. Dan? Speaking of Eddie's, seems he's found his like big idea now, hasn't he? He's been owning this like life in- and like at the start, I was like, oh, this is quite funny, like it's a bit of a joke. And now it's turned into this massive thing and like all his long forms have just been blowing up. He did one on Winston Churchill. He's just done one on, what else did he do one on? Ian Fleming. And he's got like 1.4 million views at the minute, I think, on that one. And he's just got yeah, like nice. thousands of likes on them. So yeah, what do you guys think about that? I love it. I think it's class. What I also like about it is, so let me just bring it up in front of me. Yeah, so he didn't actually, he didn't go freaking crazy on like clickbait. The thing I like about long form is you don't figure nuts on a massive clickbait thread. You can just do a good image, like a decent title. It's more about everything above the fold, isn't it? Than just, oh, the hook has to be nice and then people will open it. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there's so many good hooks with like shit advice afterwards, like all these platitude accounts and stuff. And like a lot of the long forms I like now, the ones without the like, the nice little clickbait hook, but they're just like super informative, like that um, cultural tutor guy. His ones are amazing, um, stuff like that. So I'm trying to find more accounts like that to like take inspiration from, where it's not as much. Oh, you know how to write a hook, so you're just going to get likes, but people don't actually find value in the long form. I tell you what annoys mm-hmm. me on long forms is when people move the show more into like a deliberately really clickbait position early on. Sometimes I just won't click it out of spite. I do I, that every time. I, I don't like <laughs> I think it. you should do I it. I don't like it if it's like the very first few lines. Like that's, yeah, that I'm like, oh, come on. But if it's like mm-hmm. halfway down and then you're like, oh, maybe I need to click show more. That's fine. Yeah, you've earned it then. But I hate when it's like shock tactic one where it's like two lines or one line. And Read then this. I like it when Tats, <laughs> yeah, I like it when Tats does it where it's like just cuts it off at like a suspensable point. Yeah, it's like you don't want to you don't want to waste the lines. Like that's your chance to actually build it up because otherwise you risk like getting people interested who aren't actually going to be interested in the rest of the content because you haven't really explained enough of what's to come. Yeah, like Tats does the Costco free sample strategy where he gives you like the little cube of cheese on a cocktail stick. And if you want more, then you've got to like, <laughs> click and buy more. Whereas some people give you like just a fucking stick with no cheese on it, expect you to click. Yeah. Um, but yeah, come back to Eddie. I think he's like, I'm really happy. Like, I'm happy and sort of, it makes me think more about my brand because he's sort of, he's found his big idea for his brand. Like before he was like sort of the watermelon guy sort of the email guy also talked about Twitter growth, but there was nothing like really that all it was, was like the base offer. There was nothing kind of tying it together. Whereas now he is like, it's the like, it, the big idea is like transcends his offer. It's like covers yeah. everything. He is like the professional life enjoyer and he lives that life. It's like the end goal that everyone wants. He lives that life through the email marketing, through growing his Twitter account, through watermelons and chilling out like it just ties everything together beautifully it's the world building isn't it because ben talked about world yeah. building eddie eddie mentioned it as well where you're not just building like a brand you're building like a whole universe that people you pull people into so now like all you know because he always refers to like you know watermelons and now life enjoying that's like his world he's building you can never say like oh the world you're building is wrong but it just keeps people in there doesn't it? It keeps you mm-hmm. interested. You can't and it's kind of like either, he's built his world not by finding the big idea straight away, but by sticking things in the world and then eventually finding the idea, like the watermelon, the topless like videos by the pool, talking about beginning the email guy for a bit. And then now he's just like, with all that stuff, he's sort of like discovered what his world actually is. And it's kind of like, yeah, similar to like J.K. Molina's like St. Cash, although it's, there's less things necessarily in that world. It's like just encapsulate everything about J.K. and what he does so perfectly. Um, so yeah, something definitely something to think about. It yeah, seems same. so <laughs> obvious. It seems so obvious now that he's done it. It was like, oh yeah, that yeah. makes sense. But like beforehand, you wouldn't have. Yeah, it makes been you able to guess it. So like, it can take that, years like, for you to like find your big the idea. Tip of the pyramid, the thing that just sums up your thing, and it's your thing, it's your universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like no one can compete with that now. Like professional Comes life time, enjoyer it? sounds yeah, so good yeah, as well. Yeah, it's so good. good. <laughs> it takes time, doesn't it? Kieran Drew only had digital freedom in January, and he already had a hundred k followers. So it takes time. I think you evolve. Don't you? It's not something you can just transplant on day one of a brand new account. Like, oh, I'm this account with this big idea, and here's my whole universe. Like, it builds over time, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. and you don't need it to grow. 
it's something that's like a bonus. I feel like it's almost like what makes you survive and like takes you onto the next big body stage of being a brand. So you're not just like that 100k brand, which just like chats about random shit and no one really knows him. Like even like Aaron Will, he's so, he's got his messaging so dialed down now. But like I, I could know his tweets every single time. Like his me- even though he doesn't necessarily yeah. have like a name, which like ties all together. It's like, although I think he's going for like the authority side of thing, but his messaging, he's so good at writing similar style of content, similar message in just a slightly different way. I think people just love it because they just like want to keep coming back for more. The best thing about what Eddie's done is if you now were like, oh, I'm not a professional life enjoyer, I'm the optimizer hater or something like that, it would be like, you'd be so blatantly ripping him off. Like he's, it's like he's put a big flag down and put a fence around it. That's his space, mm. you can't, you can't take it. Yeah. I know you've been digging into a little magazine from Ben Settle. And actually, funny enough, yeah, Eddie, Eddie apparently had a call. He managed to win a call with Ben Settle. Oh, and he really? like asked about, yeah, he asked him about the, life enjoyer idea and Ben was like you you need to run with that that's so good like take it um, how did he get onto a goal then when was this quite recently I did, yeah quite recently I think. I think it was like something on his list that he managed to win a call or something along those lines um sick. I know really sick but I know you've been you ordered a little book a magazine from it which you'll be chatting about have you had any like top takeaways since reading it yeah the top takeaways is he just like kind of liked the life enjoyer thing I think the daily emails is almost like version of that because it's almost like a philosophy in a way like it's not the only way to do things by any means it's the way like, he does things and the way that's like his system just it works mm. for him. It comes like it's the infotainment thing so for me it's the takeaway like you, you should never hard teach in an email because people just get used to being hard taught it's like not fun it's not fun for them especially in the age of like endless content where you can just google it or chat gpt it um, it's much better to just tell people like what they need to do than tell them how to do it because you can just tell people like what to do and then give them a little well you know if you want to find out what these things are they're down below here and yeah the main, it's that plus the it's the world building as well like ben's got all these things like spells guru funny and he talks about you kind of know even like his political beliefs and things like that come through quite a lot in his emails whereas a lot of people would be too, way too scared to mm-hmm. go into that but it just means like if you vibe with him like now he's when he arrives in my inbox, I'm like, oh, sick. I'll, I'll read this when I'm having my tea or my coffee or something. Do you really want to be that level where people are happy in your world? Yeah, it's like beyond just creating content, really. I hate it. I don't, there's some people live it. I, li- I really like Ross. I don't think it's so. It's Ross Harkness. I really like him. But it just seems like because he like really lives. It. Like it seems like he needs that routine. Like he's not just mm-hmm. doing it for the sake. So I, like I love that, a daily but- routine. Yeah, I, I, I probably need one. They do. He just smokes and rides. I don't know. For me, the uh, thing with the morning routine is just not having to think. Like, I just want to know, like, little menial daily things that I want in my life. I don't want to have to think about when I do them or if I do them or that. I just want to wake up and do them. So, like, if I know, I want to I wanna sleep similar time. I want to wake a similar time. And then I want to know, okay, tomorrow morning. Like, some days, obviously, it's also when you stick by and be like, oh, I just feel like writing today. But I want to know I wake up and I go to the gym and I just smash it out and then I can get back and write and then I can think about what I want to do for the rest of the day. But I definitely do like, I find also like the repetitiveness, like if it's something that I want to do regularly, then actually just sticking it in some sort of routine just means I don't have to think about when to do it or don't really have to rely on any motivation. It's just like, oh yeah, that's what I'm doing today. Um, but yeah, I think it can take, be taken too far. And it is all about just finding what ticks for you. Like I know a lot of people, like what I found recently, it's like I never used to write in the mornings. Or uh, there's a period here in Southeast Asia where I was writing after lunch, like after food. I've noticed like writing, hitting the gym and then writing in the morning. It is so much easier to smash out a long form and like any other writing in that period than it is like after lunch or before dinner. Like it's so like you just get so many less words per minute. Um, So yeah, Yeah. I think it's definitely a place to it, but you just have to figure out what works best for you ultimately. Coming back, touching on the cultural tutor as well, something I thought that was really interesting is... Shampiri saying, anytime you, anytime you enter like a space where some people sort of treat it as a joke or don't take it so seriously and you take it ultra serious, your results can be like way and beyond what most people think is possible. So like obviously like writing tweets and that sort of thing is most people would never really like consider that a job or like something to take that seriously or something you do here and there, like write a bit of content or write a thread. Whereas he came at it and he was like, this is the only thing I, I'm going to 
write a massive fuck up thing every day. And that's the only thing I have to do. And then he's obviously now he's got like 1.5 million subs and however many like subscribers to his newsletter as well, um, which I thought was interesting. I kind of believe that. Is that I always find there's only one task I can do in a day where I really apply myself fully to it. Everything after that is just like admin or it doesn't get full attention. It's not as good. Yeah, it's kind of like walking through mud. Yeah, exactly. Much better just to choose the big thing and knock it off. Yeah. Being a bit of a... Go for it, Dale. Can you hear him? That Welsh Wi-Fi is so bad. It's worse than <laughs> Bali Wi-Fi. Yeah, for once, I've actually got yeah. yeah, I've actually got the better Wi-Fi for once. You can't be a life enjoyer in Wales when you got no fucking internet. Do you want to touching on the opposite of a life enjoyer, Alex or Mosey? Yeah, I was gonna say I hadn't heard about his slave slaving controversy, but uh, yeah. Oh, well, is that actually controversy? Speak. Well, I don't know, but it's, yes, it Alex or Mosey, like I've heard this quote. About it. Forgive me if I'm misquoting it, but he says. He talked about hard work and he says, look, there was a time in history and slaves would work basically 16 hours a day with a little bit of time to sleep. So if they could do it, why can't I do it? But like, yeah, yeah. I don't get why you'd want to, it's like, even if that is true, do you really want to be like a slave at your own business? That doesn't sound very fun. Yeah. He's hitting the hustlers there, isn't he? Because his routine is kind of mental. No, it's not mental, but he wakes up at like four in the morning. I think he works then literally till noon. And then I think he takes a lot of meetings. And then I don't know if he works again, but no hate to it, obviously. Like, he's obviously, he's going to be, you know, he's worth hundreds of millions. So it obviously works, but kind of crazy. Yeah, he seems fucking mad driven. Like, it's like when he talks about when he was running multiple companies, never sleeping. And then, like, the thing that saved him was, like, that offer that he wrote up within, like, he just, he stayed up all night to, like, I don't know, 4 a.m. something, writing an offer of how to teach, giving people the resources to essentially teach them how to do a course, a gym launch, instead of him doing it himself. And I ended up saving his business, but I was like, fair play. Like, I was, like when push comes to shove, you know he's the man who's got to fucking get shit done. But I find comparing it to slaving is a bit different because it's not like the slaves wanted to work that hard or anything. They were literally forced to in fucking horrible conditions. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be one of these people that's like, oh, Alex, you mentioned slaves. Let's all definitely go viral. Yeah, true. It's true. If you turn to follow account, he said that he definitely gets some some big heat. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think you have like 10k followers, you're still technically a tiny account on you. There's just random accounts yeah. that just comment on the news that have got like 100,000. There's also so many 10k accounts that get to 10k, kind of take their foot off the pedal and then never get around putting their foot back on the pedal and they're just sort of stuck around 10k meandering up to eleven, maybe coming back down because they just can't get back into it. It's true. Um, I had an interesting quote retweet the other day, actually. So I got a DM. Someone sent me their tweet and was like, please, can you retweet? I mean, they didn't actually send me last week. They just sent this message. They're like, please, can you retweet my last tweet? If you are not a pedophile, just this once, please. <laughs> And then I like checked his account and it was like locked anyway. So the only way I could do it is if I like viewed it. And so I made, I did a tweet about it. And I just said, he drives a hard bargain. And someone quote retweeted it. And it was like, it's high time these shitty DM roasting stops. Just make your fucking decision and let it rot in your damn head. You can't tell me you've not been in this position before. It's like, no, I've never threatened yeah. blackmail someone with being a pedophile for not retweeting my posts. Yeah, that's bad. Wait, I love the DM roasting. I don't get this virtue signaling. Oh, everyone starts somewhere. I roasted myself the other day. I just let someone replied nine months later to my Let's Connect DM. So I just posted my DM, roasted it. Like, I don't give a shit. I don't think you should include that name necessarily. But if it's a really bad one, why the fuck not? It's funny. Yeah. If it goes, mate. I've even, been, I've even been retweeted for a DM being terrible. It was when I first started. And I can't remember what I said. I, I like sent something and he was like, this is the worst. He, he like screenshot it and did a tweet and he was like, rate, yeah. Yeah, and he was like, rate, rate this cold DM from one to 10. And then he sent me the tweet and he just stuck it and he was like a 50, 100K account or something. And I was like, fuck, bro. And so I thought I was done for. I was like, shit, he's going to expose me and my like 200 followers are going to just fucking leave. But yeah, I think, I think like if someone does something stupid, it's, you're, you're given all right to laugh about it. As long, and if you're not really revealing the name, 
then it's like, I mean, I'm also the DMs these days, the quality is so low, but I feel like you need to get a little bit of awareness out there to tell people like, come on, wake, wake up. Yeah. Great. I get a lot of the hate on cold then. I know that it's, they're bad, some of them, but they, if they didn't work, people wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. I'd say go for it really. Same. I remember there was a period where I was big time hating on it. I said, like, why would you do that sort of thing? But it's kind of just like being slightly, I guess, naive as a small creator and not really seeing things. And then also, I think a lot of people, it just fits into the branding. Like if you can say that you run purely off inbound, that's obviously in a more attractive position being to sell someone something because you, you can basically say like my way is easier. You don't have to do this thing that no one likes doing. And I think if you do go hard on it. A meme. I think it's yeah. a meme. It's just everyone hates sales calls. Everyone hates outbound. So everyone's really attracted to the person who says like, oh, look, you don't have to do it if you follow my stuff when most people who rely on inbound have like one sales call a week. So Yeah, hardly any sales calls. And you have to rely on just being known as so good that people just come to you, which is obviously something that takes time to get to. And in order to get there, you need client results. And chances are to get the client results, you're going to have to send them DMs first. 